Ah, hello. So I don't think we're quite on. I, I guess we have titles here, but I'm not seeing anything on the scope. Oh, I guess it turned itself off. So, um, yeah, hi, and welcome to another week of, uh, of um, That Atheist Show. Um, actually, we're not one of the first one of that, uh, of examining the uh, narrative. And, uh, boy, that's a good, we're having a good start. Um, okay, so there I am on the screen, and, and I'm less confused than I was moments ago. So, yeah, I guess uh, this week what we're going to do is we're going to play a, uh, what's called a response video from a YouTuber that talks about a um, rape case in Canada uh, that's gotten quite a bit of press. Uh, so there is uh, one slide to start this off with, so let's stick that up. The person who did the video, his name is Karen Strawn. And you can find her stuff by going up either to YouTube or Google and um, Googling uh, Karen Strawn or Girl Writes What or the other group that she works with uh, that sort of do these uh, group um, conversations is called Honey Badger Radio. Um, Karen's a uh, uh, basically a 50-year-old uh, mother of three. Uh, she has... Uh, a daughter and two sons, and about in 2010, uh, she began, she sort of figured that her daughter was doing fine because, you know, as she sees it, the society advantages women pretty seriously, and was finding that there were problems, you know, with her sons, not that they were causing a problem, but that the society was not treating them very well, that they were being told about their toxic masculinity and all the rest, and that sort of bothered her. So, she began writing and is described essentially as sending feminists uh, in search of their safe spaces. So um, we'll talk about the video after we watch it, so may, let's just start it up. Hi guys, sorry it's been so long and I'm just going to apologize in advance for the length of this video response, uh, particularly compared to the length of the video I'm critiquing. Um, but as you may have already noticed, these kinds of young and perky pro-feminist videos tend to kind of dispense gallons of bullshit with a fire hose in under five minutes, in which case takes you hours to clean it all up. So. Um, that said, let's just dive right in to the bullshit. As some of you may have heard, former Canadian radio personality and mouth-breathing egomaniacal creep lord Gian Gameshi will likely be avoiding his second sexual assault trial next month. Yeah, he will. And he did. Gomeshi is signing a peace bond, which is basically a document that's like, Yeah, I'm a goddamn monster, but how about this? I just won't go near you for a year. Uh, it's actually not what a peace bond is. A peace bond is an agreement to not go near someone for a specified period of time, yes, but there's no admission of guilt, implicit or explicit, con conveyed by signing one. Any given individual might sign a peace bond in order to avoid the egregious legal costs, publicity, and disruptions of a trial, and their willingness to sign such a document is not necessarily any reflection on their guilt or innocence. As a side note, if the Crown actually had a solid case against Gomeshi on this second round, um, I don't think they would have accepted this deal, now would they? It might interest you to know that it's been revealed that Roberto Veri, who is believed to have been the Crown's star witness in this second trial and who claimed to have witnessed the incident in question while he was working for Q at the CBC, wasn't even employed by the CBC until more than 18 months after the alleged incident allegedly took place. So when the Crown brought the case, they thought they had a corroborating witness. Turns out, they don't. They had someone who was willing to lie on the stand about witnessing an incident he couldn't possibly have witnessed. Isn't that interesting, Megan? Oigo? Oigo? And you know what, guys? I'm done being nice, I'm done being cute, and I'm done being sarcastic. So y'all better strap the f*** in because I'm about to throw down. Give me everything you got, tough girl. First of all, let's talk about Judge Face McSlutshame for a second. You mean Justice William Horkins? Is that who you mean? Look, f*** 
face, we were all expecting you to fail. Because that's what the justice system does to victims of assault. It's your deal, I get that. But to go out of your way, in your verdict, to accuse these women of deception? Ah, you mean when he drew attention to the fact that they persistently, willfully, and repeatedly perjured themselves regarding facts material to their complaints? You mean when they did that? You mean like when Lucy de Cotter repeatedly claimed she avoided all contact with Gomeshi after he allegedly assaulted her, but then solid evidence was presented that she aggressively pursued a romantic and sexual relationship with him for more than a year afterward? A campaign that included handwritten love letters signed, I love your hands, and emailed declarations the day after the alleged assault that what had happened the night before made her want to f*** his brains out? You mean like when, in complete contradiction to her sworn testimony, documented conversations were unearthed wherein she danced clumsily around the M-word? You know, marriage? Oh, and then there was that photo she sent him of herself in a bikini filleting a beer bottle. You mean like that kind of stuff? You mean like the other complainants similarly testifying, persistently when challenged, that they had also avoided all contact with him after the alleged assaults only to be caught in remarkably similar lies as de Couture was? One having even gone on further dates with Gomeshi and engaging in further sexual activity with him? After a sexual assault that she testified left her so traumatized she didn't want anything more to do with him ever again? You mean like that? Now here's the reason why I find your framing so annoying, Megan. Judge Horkins went out of his way in his verdict, which is available to read online, you know, so you can out go and read it, because you obviously haven't. He went out of his way to stress that because the complainants gave false or erroneous testimony, that didn't necessarily mean the assaults they were alleging didn't take place. He literally said that a finding of not guilty is not the same as a finding of innocence. He also went out of his way to point out that just because the complainant's testimony was consistently inconsistent and reliably unreliable throughout the trial, even this doesn't mean they were lying. He drew a clear distinction between testimony that's false because of intentional deceit and testimony that's false due to inaccurate recall or innocent error, and he allowed that the latter might have been the case. And even though he did suggest that de Couture had, in his opinion, attempted to deceive both police and the court on several relevant matters with the intention of bolstering her complaint against Gameshi, he went on to stress that sometimes actual victims do stuff like that, and it's understandable, and that even this type of deceit couldn't really inform his decision to acquit. That's a lot of benefit of the doubt, Megan, given by a judge to three complaining witnesses whose sworn testimony completely disagreed with every single available piece of physical evidence. Now, if we're up to me, they'd all be back in a courtroom ASAP on charges of perjury, especially de Couture, given what else I've seen of her regarding this case, all of which points to her being a self-serving liar. But, you know, the judge made an explicit point of emphasizing that the complainants might not have actually been lying under oath intentionally, and that even if they were lying under oath, it's somehow excusable because sometimes real victims do that kind of thing, even under oath. So, no perjury charges are pending. You'll be happy to know. And hinting at the notion that they're making it all up is some really, really, really f***ed up sh now, do you know what usually happens to people who are found to have intentionally lied under oath in order to unjustly harm another individual, Megan? Things like massive fines and prison time. And I don't think you realize the gravity of perjury and why it's considered a serious crime. When a person petitions the criminal justice system to take action on their behalf, they are asking the system, the government, the state, to kidnap that person, forcibly restrain them, and forcibly confine them. Those would all be felonies if an individual citizen committed them against another person. The reason those actions are not felonies when the state commits them is because we, the people, have legitimated the authority of the state to do this on behalf of other citizens when it's necessary and only when it's necessary. When the state gets it wrong and convicts an innocent person, they are committing kidnapping, illegal forcible restraint, and illegal forcible confinement. So we insist that they have to be pretty damn sure. Now, when a complainant lies under oath in order to bolster their case against a defendant, they are deceiving the state into potentially committing a series of violent crimes against a fellow citizen. They are turning 
the state into their accomplice. They are turning the criminal justice process into their own personal mafia. And while Judge Horkins implied that the complainants might have lied, he went on to make excuses for these women, as if they're toddlers unable to understand the gravity of a sworn oath to tell the truth, or the degree of injustice that can be perpetrated by courts of law when they are misled, intentionally or otherwise. Do me a favor, remember the lunch you ate on April 23rd, 2002? Yeah, name three ingredients. Oh, you don't remember? I guess you didn't eat lunch that day. The last time I had food poisoning was over 20 years ago. I was seven months pregnant with my first child, so it would have been in May 1994. And I can guarantee you, I remember exactly what I'd eaten just before I spent almost a full day on my knees in front of the toilet. And the basmati rice, which has a rather coarse texture, felt so awful coming back up that I've never eaten basmati rice since. I gave the rest of the bag of rice to a friend and I swore off of it forever. And you know what else I can tell you? You won't find any evidence, ever, at all, that I have gone out of my way to eat basmati rice at any given opportunity. You won't find a paper trail of restaurant receipts wherein I can be shown to have ordered basmati rice as a favored side dish. You won't find basmati rice cookbooks on my bookshelves that were purchased after the incident, and you certainly won't find Facebook pages devoted to basmati rice wherein I gush about how much I love it in the comments and beg other people for recipes. Because, you know, unlike what seems to be the case with Decouter, the incident was so traumatic for me, I actually avoided what traumatized me from that point on rather than aggressively seeking out more of it. Now, ask me what I had for lunch last Wednesday. Probably couldn't tell you. Also, also, while we're chatting here, why do you think someone would make up a rape accusation? I don't know, to socially destroy a man, to get a leg up in a custody battle or a divorce settlement, to get out of paying cab fare because he hooked up with her earlier in the week and he forgot her name when they ran into each other again, to deflect her parents' attention from her failing grades, to trick a guy into liking her, to get out of writing her bar exams, to conceal an infidelity or explain a pregnancy or STI so her parents wouldn't punish her for being out past curfew, because she got swept up in anti-rape activism and thought a rape hoax would get attention for the cause. All of these have formed the motivations of documented false accusers. Megan, here's a suggestion. If you want to know why a woman would make up a false rape accusation, why don't you actually do some research on it? There are plenty of documented cases of false rape accusations out there in newspapers. In most cases, the accuser's motivation has either been explicitly determined by the system, or it can be implied or inferred based on the surrounding circumstances. Of course, in some cases, there's no reason other than that the accuser is mentally ill. For money or retribution? Because an infinitesimal number of assault cases actually make it into a courtroom, let alone reach a verdict that falls in favor of the victim. Infinitesimal, huh? You know, between 60 and 70% of sexual assault cases in Canada go unreported to police. This is comparable to most other index crimes, including other assaults. The majority of unreported cases go unreported for the same reason you probably wouldn't schlep yourself down to the police station for three hours to report that your garden hose went missing from your yard. The reason being that these are trivial incidents. The victim can't be bothered to report because the instant incident wasn't a big enough deal to justify an hour or three filling out a police statement, let alone taking it to trial. So, we can toss about half of all sexual assaults detected in the surveys that you feminists love to do into the victim just wasn't that annoyed by it pile. Now, you can choose to be upset about that, and as a feminist, I'm sure you will be. You know, the whole idea that a woman could be sexually assaulted and not think it's that big a deal. For myself, I actually find it encouraging that so many incidents of sexual assault that make up this epidemic you guys are ginning up in the media, that so many of those fall under the umbrella of, oh, some dude grabbed my butt in a nightclub, I told him to go f*** himself and kept on dancing. Of the sexual assault cases that do end up in court, some 45% end up in conviction. Now, that's not bad. The conviction rate for murder is 56%. And it's really not bad considering such cases are based solely on the testimony of the complainant quite frequently. 
Often what little physical evidence there might be is physical evidence of a legal act, at least until you feminists manage to outlaw sex. Now, Megan, I'm going to explain something about the law to you, and it's going to sound all legal easy, and hopefully it won't go over your head, and it'll probably make you mad, so take a deep breath. For most forms of crime, there are two elements required, the actus reus, or guilty act, and mens rea, guilty mind. So let's just do an example. Let's say I'm driving in a school zone and I'm following the posted speed limit and I'm paying proper attention and a little kid runs out from behind a parked car right in front of my vehicle and I just can't stop in time and I run over them. Now the actus reus, the wrongful act, is me running over a child. But I lack the required mens rea for it to be considered a crime. I had no intent to do it, nor was I negligent or in violation of the rules of the road when it happened. Without that mens rea, it's just an accident. It's not a crime. Now, sexual assault is a crime whose two necessary elements are based entirely on state of mind. The actus reus of rape is based on the victim's lack of consent, which is a state of mind. The mens rea of rape is based on the defendant's awareness of the victim's lack of consent, which is also a state of mind. Now, regarding sexual assault in Canada, mens rea is also based on what's called a reasonable person standard, which means that even if the accused was somehow unaware that the victim was not consenting, if a reasonable person in his position would have been aware of that, he can still be found guilty. Now, here's where it gets difficult with rape versus vehicular manslaughter. With vehicular manslaughter, the actus reus is already firmly established. It's never legal to run over a kid. It's, it's never in accordance with the law to run over a child with your car. There's a dead kid lying in the road. There's blood and other, other evidence on my car. It's understood right then and there that something wrongful has happened. And all that remains to be determined is mens rea. Was this horrible thing that happened an accident or a crime? Now with rape, because both elements of the crime are based on state of mind alone, and the only thing separating the legal act of sex from the illegal act of rape is two people's states of mind, the actus reus is not always firmly established at the outset. More than this, the physical evidence is not always helpful in establishing actus reus. It's always wrongful conduct to run over a child with your car, Megan. It is not always wrongful conduct to have sex with another human being. What this means is that unlike the blood and hair in the grill of my car, right, semen samples are not evidence of rape. They're evidence of sex, a legal act. DNA under the victim's fingernails might be there because she was resisting a rapist, or she was raking her nails down her lover's back to urge him to go deeper and harder. See what I mean? See why it's difficult? This is why sexual assaults that occur in dating, relationship, and acquaintance contexts are so difficult to prove, because frequently the only physical evidence is evidence that sex happened, and sex is not necessarily a wrongful act. When you're talking about a stranger with a weapon jumping out of the bushes on a jogging path and raping a female jogger at four o'clock in the morning, there's no need to establish actus reus. No sane person would believe that any woman in that situation would consent to sex. But thanks to feminism and the sexual revolution, women making complaints of rape increasingly find themselves doing so in the context of situations where it's not unreasonable to believe a woman would consent to sexual activity with a man, on a date, within a relationship, with a f buddy, at a party. Women consensually have sex in these contexts all the time, and it's perfectly legal. You're not even allowed to look at, down on them for it. So unlike the assumptions that can be made regarding the woman on the jogging path, Women have sex with men in these more murky contexts all the time these days, and that complicates even establishing in a court of law that a crime, that a wrongful act, was even committed. So, in this context, you have to first establish, through the state of mind of the victim, that a wrongful act, wrongful conduct, actually occurred before then 
further establishing whether the accused is the person who did it and is also criminally culpable for that wrongful act given his state of mind. It then becomes he said, she said, and at that point, the credibility and reliability of witness testimony is everything. Everything. It becomes the entire case, and when it's found to be neither credible nor reliable, the case falls apart, as it must. For attention? Yeah, because there's nothing that a survivor loves more than having their name smeared across national media. Wait, what? Why do you think someone would make up a rape accusation? For attention? Yeah, because there's nothing that a survivor loves more than having their name smeared across national media. Why do you think someone would make up a rape accusation? For attention? Yeah, because there's nothing that a survivor loves more than having their name smeared across national media. I don't know if you realize this, Megan, but someone who makes up a rape accusation isn't a survivor. They don't feel any of the trauma or shame associated with having been violated because they weren't violated by someone. They're actually violating someone, and sometimes they're willing to do it for the attention that comes with it. People who make up false rape accusations for attention do it to capitalize on the public sympathy that actual rape victims deserve. They callously hijack the goodwill of kind-hearted people and undermine the credibility of actual victims by doing so. Now you might ask, who would intentionally make up a rape accusation? Well, who would intentionally leak a sex tape of themselves? Not me, not you, but Kim Kardashian would. So would Paris Hilton and a bunch of other freaking Hollywood D-list celebrities. Who would fake a hate crime? Not me, not you, but Charlie Rogers would, and did, and Meg Lanker Simons would, and did. You know, Charlie Rogers even went so far as to carve homophobic slurs and Christian symbols into her own body to make it more convincing. Who would stage a home invasion and, ra and a rape just to convince her husband to move to a better neighborhood? Not me, not you, but Lori Martinez did, going so far as to pee on herself, cut her lip with a pin, and have a friend in boxing gloves rough her up to make it more convincing to the police. I'm going to let you in on a little secret you might not be aware of, Megan. There are people out there who do all kinds of fucked up things for all kinds of fucked up reasons. And if it's easy enough to believe that there are men out there capable of holding a woman down and f***ing her against her will, one would think, one would think that it might be just possible that there are women out there who are capable of doing f***ed up things like that. And the people who do f***ed up things like making false complaints of rape, they are not survivors of anything. There is no trauma or shame or fear from an actual rape to stop them. All there is, is the objective. Whether it's to ruin someone, get money from them, get attention, solve a problem, whatever. And yet here you are asking, why would someone make up a false rape accusation? Well, I'm going to ask you, why would anyone rape another person? Because they're f***ed up! Why would a survivor want their name smeared across national media? That's what you're asking. As if someone who makes up a story about a rape is a survivor of rape. Unbelievable. Alongside words like slut and and I'm going to kill this slut. You ever wonder what kind of words a man falsely convicted of rape might get to hear? You know, not just on social media where people often comment that he should be castrated or raped every day in prison. You know, what words does he hear from the prisoner's dock? You know, like, guilty? I sentence you to, you know, 20 years in prison? How about the words he gets to hear from inside his prison cell? Yeah, where he's just a number until he's out, and then he's just a number to his parole officer, right? What do you think he gets to hear? What words do you think he hears from HR departments when he's repaid his debt to society, and now he's looking to put back together the f***ing shattered pieces of his life by, you know, trying to get a job while on the sex offender registry? 
Can you imagine being innocent and having everyone believe you're a rapist? And that as a rapist, you deserve to be beaten, castrated, raped, punished, shunned, socially and economically destroyed for the rest of your life? Imagine the mandatory counseling you'd have to take where you're forced to choke down all of that feminist Kool-Aid, right? And then vomit it back up, you know, forcing yourself to like choke out those words, spit them out, you know, how you've changed your attitude towards sex and women. Can you imagine what would it be like to have to go through those motions, to have to say those things and hear them, right, about yourself if you were innocent? You think maybe parroting words you're required to repeat before they'll stamp your file with rehabilitated might be painful, might make you feel ashamed, might make you feel worthless if you were, you know, innocent. You ever think falsely accused men might sometimes get victim blamed? You know, like when those five minority young men falsely accused at Hofstra University, you know, the ones who only avoided prison sentences of up to 25 years because of incontrovertible video evidence that the sex was consenting. You know, when they were berated by the press and pundits and the public for asking for it, even after they were exonerated, you know, because they acted like dogs and didn't respect women. To have a talk show host say that even though the evidence showed it was all consensual and the woman was so into it, she was egging him on, egging them on the whole time, right? The young men were still in the wrong, that they behaved like pigs rather than like gentlemen, that they kind of sort of got what they deserved because they didn't treat the woman, a woman who was caught on camera, you now just begging to be rammed right, with the proper respect that women deserve, and that they should learn a lesson from this. And the lesson is that they should respect women. Yeah, I'm sure respecting women like their accuser is just real high on their priority list. I'm going to leave a link to that Steve Wilkos show episode in the low bar so you can watch it. And keep in mind, if that one guy hadn't abstained, or if he hadn't chosen to video the entire incident, these young men, who'd done nothing but have sex with an enth enthusiastically, affirmatively consenting young woman, would likely have gone to prison for decades. Because she stuck to her story right up until the police told her they had incontrovertible video evidence of the incident, that someone there had filmed the entire thing. Only then did she recant. So I don't think there's any reason to believe she wouldn't have stuck to it all the way to a guilty verdict. And by the way, since you expressed some curiosity earlier, her reason for making that ac accusation was she didn't want her boyfriend to know she'd cheated on him, and she didn't want her fellow students to think she was a slut for banging four guys in a public bathroom. And her punishment for trying to put five young men in prison for up to 25 years each for no reason than to spare herself some embarrassment? Mandatory counseling. Okay, prosecutor dum-dum, way to prep your clients. Don't blame the prosecutor, Megan. The only expectation placed on these women was that they tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They all swore an oath to do just that, not just in court, but also in their sworn statements to Toronto police. And then they said a whole bunch of things that were demonstrably untrue, and left out a whole bunch of relevant details for which there was ample physical evidence. And oh, by the way, the complainants are not the prosecutor's clients. The head of state of the people of Canada is. The Queen. You know, the Crown. Regina. R versus Gian Gomeshi. The complainants are witnesses for the Crown. Moreover, it's not the prosecutor's job to investigate. It's the job of the police to investigate. And then they take their evidence and present it to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor decides whether to take the case forward based on that evidence. Witness preparation in a criminal trial is as follows. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Those complainants had one job, Megan. One job. And they f***ed it up. They f***ed it up from the moment they approached the police. I can only imagine your trial prep must have gone something like, Okay, I'm gonna send you into the underworld to go mano a mano with the King of Darkness, Hades himself. Here's a marshmallow crown and a book of children's knock-knock jokes. Have fun! 
So who's the devil here? Gomeshi? Judge Horkins? <laughs> Marie Hennon? Or is it the legal process itself, which is designed in such a way that the state can't just grab people out of their homes and lock them away in little boxes for years at a time without a good reason? How were you caught off guard so many times in this trial? Because feminists like you have convinced Toronto police services to adopt Listen and Believe as their best practices when investigating sexual assault cases, Megan. I know. I know, Megan. It looks like incompetence, and it is. But it's an engineered incompetence. Engineered by feminists. To appease feminist activists, Toronto police have adopted a policy of taking sexual assault complainants 100% at their word, avoiding any sensitive questions that might make them feel disbelieved or re-victimized, and closing investigations without any real effort to uncover potentially exculpatory evidence. You know, because that would make complainants feel disbelieved. So you feminists managed to get exactly what you wanted from Toronto Police Services and it's blown up in your face. Why? Because regardless of what the police do or don't do, the criminal court system cannot adopt listen and believe as a cornerstone. Reasonable doubt and listen and believe are legally incompatible concepts. So good job feminists. You've managed to ensure that the conviction rate for sexual assault will plummet by placing unreasonable constraints on the people tasked with investigating sex crimes. Bravo. Oh wait, brava. This is an assault case, not a long weekend in Margaritaville. Wake the f up! The only people who treated this case like a long weekend in Margaritaville are the people who've downed the feminist Kool-Aid, Megan. That is, Toronto Police Services, whose investigation, according to feminist best practices, was to take the complainant's statements, nod vigorously, express their unadulterated belief in every single word, rubber stamp it, and send it off to the Crown. Of course, once the verdict was in, feminists all over Canada started expressing a desire to turn the court portion of these cases into a long weekend in Mar Margaritaville as well. Investigations? Pfft, who needs them? Burden of proof? Ha! Reasonable doubt? Why, that's just passé. It's the year that it is, people, whatever year that is now. This whole criminal justice system is really inconvenient. Can't we just remodel the entire thing so that when a woman makes a complaint, the guy just goes directly to prison? Now that would be justice. To the defense, my only words to you are that I hope I never have to be within a hundred feet of a person who, with pride, describes himself as Hannibal Lecter. Unless, of course, that person is Anthony Hopkins. Okay. Number one. Marie Hennon never actually said that about herself. Former Attorney General Michael Bryant described her as seeming to channel Hannibal Lecter. Perhaps she took that as a compliment. I would if I were in her shoes. Number two. I'm willing to bet that if you were falsely accused of, say, inappropriately touching some kid you were babysitting, and you had the money to hire her, you'd be in Marie Hennon's office in a f***ing heartbeat. And I doubt you'd be upset if she made one of the Crown's witnesses cry or look like a liar. The man of the hour, Prince Scumlord. Way to get away with it. Get away with what, Megan? You don't know that he did what he was accused of. You don't know that he didn't. The only people who know are the people involved. But what do you know about Lucy de Cater? Here's what I know about her. She's willing to conceal pertinent information from the police and the court while under oath. She's willing to say the opposite of the truth for whatever reason while under oath. She was willing to collude extensively with another complainant, documented in hundreds of chat logs regarding the details of their complaints, and then tell the court while under oath that she never discussed the case with any of the other complainants that she was willing to tell the press that the incident with Gomeshi didn't traumatize her at all, and then give demonstrably false testimony in court that she was so traumatized by the incident that she avoided any further contact with him. And I know that, in her own words, she wants to be, to sexual assault survivors, what David Beckham is to Armani underwear. That she took it upon herself to go fishing for other women with a possible grievance against Gomeshi and convince them to accuse him in the press, and then, after that, file complaints with police. That's what I know about Lucy de Cater. You're like OJ, except you didn't need to try on a single glove. Well, yeah, Megan, because gloves are physical evidence. And remember, there was no physical evidence whatsoever in the Gomeshi case. Well, I guess except for all that exculpatory physical evidence is what I meant to say. There were no bloody gloves, Megan. 
No Bruno Molly shoe prints, no blood in Gomeshi's car. In fact, there was no car because Gomeshi didn't even own the car in question until seven months after the assault he was accused of committing therein. There were no photos of injuries, no DNA swabs taken from under the victim's fingernails, no nothing. So, let's tally things up, shall we? On the side of the prosecution, there was the testimony of three women who gave consistently and demonstrably false, misleading, or inaccurate accounts of what had happened. On the side of the defense was a mountain of physical evidence that directly contradicted their testimony. Why, I just don't understand how that guy was acquitted. Efficient. As a student in the media, I was warned by three separate people to stay away from you. All you've proven here is that off office gossip can get really nasty. I mean, come on, Megan. Be honest. You're a fat girl. You can't tell me you've never been the target of malicious gossip. I suppose every time some rumor was circulating about you in middle school, your classmate should have just listened and believed, right? And again, I have no idea whether Gomeshi is a douchebag. I suspect he may be. Maybe, maybe he is. But being a garden variety douchebag is not a crime. And for sake, he wasn't even charged with rape. From what I gather, he never actually had sexual intercourse with any of the complainants at any point, and it wasn't the complainants who were saying no, either. Ducatere, again, aggressively pursued a romantic and sexual relationship with him for more than a year after the alleged assault, and as far as I've been able to determine, he never put out for her. Isn't that interesting? And my major wasn't even radio. I don't consider myself to be a vindictive person. I know you don't. And I'm equally sure you don't consider yourself to be an ill-informed moron who thinks people should go to prison over malicious office gossip and sworn testimony that's been demonstrated to be false. And yet here you are, throwing a tantrum over the fact that a guy you heard malicious gossip about wasn't convicted based solely on testimony that was proven false. But I truly hope that you fade into a life of seclusion and misery. And I truly hope Ducater is charged with perjury because she lied by word and by omission, on the witness stand, repeatedly and persistently, and under challenge, after swearing a solemn oath to tell the truth, and she did it, hoping to put somebody else in prison. And here's the thing, Megan. There's more solid evidence that Decouter willfully and knowingly committed perjury than that Gomeshi committed those assaults. Now, you might want to live in a country where people can be put in prison based on nothing but the demonstrably false or erroneous testimony of witnesses. And if that's where you want to live, you ought to have a wonderful time in North Korea. I wish you all the best. But here in the free world, we don't allow our government to snatch people out of their homes, separate them from their families and their lives, and lock them up in little cages for years on end unless they can prove to all of us that these actions are justified. That is why the victim is not the plaintiff in a criminal case, Megan. The plaintiff is the people, or the people's representative, the Crown. That's why that's in place. I do. And to all of you commenters who are going to scroll down there and be like, me, but that's a ton of justice the marks, Megan, you didn't you just f off, okay? You took media in school, huh? I get it. Reasonable doubt is the thing you need in legal proceedings. Everyone f***ing knows that, and you don't need to be the salty dickhole that stands on a victim's shoulders to yell a fact that we already know! Oh yeah, you really seem to have internalized that whole idea. Oh wait, no, you don't seem to have. If you did, you'd be calling the complainants complainants or alleged victims, not victims. And no one is standing on a victim's shoulders to say that presumption of innocence, burden of proof, and reasonable doubt are three key elements of the criminal justice system that keep us all free from oppression and that they need to stay as they are. It is feminists who are standing on victims' shoulders to say that those things just aren't that important and should probably go away. The judicial process needs to exist and function to help people that need help. No, it does not. That is not its purpose. The purpose of the criminal courts is to balance the need to punish those who are proven to have transgressed the law and the need to protect the innocent from wrongful conviction. The criminal courts are no one's personal grievance machine, nor do they exist to help victims. They are required to remain impartial 
and operate within and abide by the constraints of the law as written by a legislature chosen by the people and which governs solely through the consent of the people. When the complainants, in this case, chose to engage the process, they were not promised the outcome they desired. When Gomeshi was engaged against his will by the process, he was not promised the outcome he desired. Function being the operative word. And if Toronto Police Service's sexual assault unit had not rendered themselves dysfunctional by taking the advice of feminists and entrenching it in their best practices, this case would never have seen the inside of a courtroom, Megan, and rightly so. And people that need help being people like victims of assault. Again, that's not what the criminal courts are there for. And again, and again, and again, you keep just forgetting to use the word alleged. Are you sure you studied media? Because I'm almost positive they'd be interested in teaching you how to stay on the proper side of a defamation suit. So nobody is saying we need to throw out our legal process. Actually, lots of people are saying we need to throw out the standard legal process in regard to sexual assault cases. And one of the reasons they cite is that inconveniences like burden of proof, due process, and reasonable doubt standard, they just don't serve victims. Oh my goodness. So it kind of is like that. We're just saying it's broken as f Really? A legal process that has already undergone 40 years or so of feminist reform, specifically in cases of sexual assault, is broken as f I don't know if you know this, Megan, but sexual assault trials are already completely different from other criminal trials, and every single reform that has been implemented over the last 40 years has been implemented in the direction of making the process easier on complainants and making convictions easier to secure. So literally, after 40 years of feminists fixing the system, it's still broken as f Well then. Duh! Jesus Christ! Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm gonna drive to the beach and scream at the lake for a few hours. See you next week. Bye! And I'm going to sleep better at night knowing that our criminal justice process isn't being run by dumb media students who can't even be bothered to inform themselves about the cases they expound on. I'm going to sleep better at night knowing that our criminal justice process isn't some low-class rent boy eager to help any woman who's prepared to tell a marginally believable story just so she can destroy a man's life. I'm going to sleep better at night knowing that the engineered incompetence of Toronto Police Services hasn't quite trickled up to the actual court system. Yet. And I'm going to sleep better at night knowing that you only have a tiny little YouTube channel instead of a position of power in which you are capable of changing anything at all. Have a nice day, Megan. If you like this video, click subscribe and share it with a friend. I make a new video every single week. You can also find me on social media down below, and there's another video about Gian Gameshi in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen if you'd like to watch it right now. F*** that guy. Goodbye. What on the side of the defense was the mountain of physical evidence that directly contradicted... Really? Rick rolled by my own son. I just wanna tell you how I'm feeling. Won't make you understand. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna. <laughs> Hi, and uh, welcome back. Um, yeah, that I consider. Uh, of all the stuff that I found in YouTube to be probably one of my top ten favorites. I think she did an absolutely stellar job of laying out all the issues associated with this and, um, and just you know, going through them one at a time. Very methodical, very complete. Um, but, you know, it's interesting today because the Register Guard has uh, an article at the front of the city region section City and Region section, um, talking about UO, U of O student files a lawsuit suit to overturn his suspension. So you may be aware that there were the three basketball players at the U of O who are now, who basically had their entire careers ruined. Yeah. And um, they are now suing the university because they were punished, um, supposedly for raping a woman. and. You know, went through this little tribunal, uh, probably better described as a kangaroo court. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, they have on-campus tribunals, which are yeah. kind of laughable. You don't you don't get to confront your and question your accuser. You do not, um, you know, they don't listen to any evidence. It's just you know, your accuser, you're done. Goodbye. You're yeah. punished. And this intra-university policing started in the '60s yeah. and '70s, but mm -hmm. it, it's gone far too far. Yeah, and and it's you know, I mean, it's it's really you, we've been seeing it growing. And, but I would say in the last decade, it's just got obscene, yeah. gotten obscene. It really has. Um, and now's the time for this to change. And that's, you know, so again, um, it's in the news. You know, there's nothing, nothing new. I mean, you can, you can open the paper every couple of days and you'll find something out about, you know, something else has yeah. happened somewhere around the country in this, um, this war that the feminists um, have taken on in terms of enforcing political correctness. Well, and the, the real motivation, I don't think, is even a good one. I think at this point it's self-sustaining. Yeah. At this point it's an industry, like so many others. Mm -hmm. And the same people that are complaining about the prison industrial complex have created the academic feminist complex. Mm -hmm. And it has to sustain itself at this point. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they pick up more, you know, they pick up more things. They colonize more areas. Um, yeah, is the I way actually I look watched at an exchange occur a couple of days ago where people were discussing whether prostate cancer was a feminist issue. Yeah. And it eventually came to now that feminism accepts and incorporates transgenderism. Now it's considered a feminist issue. Now that we've broadened our horizons beyond yeah. what we have any business discussing whatsoever, yeah. We're now discussing classism, racism, sexism of transgendered communities. We're talking about sexual orientations of all sorts. Yeah. What does that have to do with feminism? And what does, what it, have does it have to, to do, do with, with prostate women? cancer? Yeah, well, what does it have to do with women, even? Hi, uh, you're on the air. What's your name? John. Uh, Hi, welcome, John. welcome to the show. What's up? Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate something I said on the show once before, and that is if a woman accuses a man of an illegal sex act, this uh, old uh, uh, law saying that the man is innocent, or a person is innocent until proven guilty, just flips right upside down. Yeah. Yep. If a man's accused, he's guilty unless he can prove he's innocent. And if he don't have any hard evidence to prove it, he's going to jail. Yeah. yeah well, and it speaks to the psychology of the, the society as well. It speaks to the concept that uh, a man's sexuality is implicitly viewed as dangerous. So it's presumed, first step, that, that a man is p potentially a rapist. That's the first step, is that every man has to potentially be a rapist. Yeah. And, and we, and I, I, I still uh, am bothered, bothered quite often thinking about, I wonder how many men are in jail that really done nothing wrong, that just by uh, a vindictive woman, an accusation from a vindictive woman. Well, there's, there's a, you can simply go up to Google, which I've done recently several times, um, you know, in terms of trying to pull material together to talk about this kind of thing. And then, um, you know, rape overturned or, um, you know, just any, any word for um, exonerated, it's another good word, rape, exoneration, and you'll just come up with page after page after page in Google of someone who sat in prison for 16 years, someone for five, someone for 33, someone for 20. And eventually either the accuser comes forward and says, says they lied or some physical evidence comes up. The Innocence Project um, takes on a lot of these cases. Yeah, and, and this they, extends beyond male-female interaction. This yeah. extends even to high-profile cases that are still believed today. Yeah. The, the Michael Jackson meme is one that drives me insane. The chances of Michael Jackson having actually sexually molested a child are slim to none. Uh, but it's never, that's never going to become normalized. No one's ever going to accept that story, even though the person who's the most believed case came out after Michael Jackson's death and said, I'm a liar. I lied. None of this happened, and I made my son do it. I'm a liar. And people still just go, yeah, well, Michael Jackson was a pedophile who raped boys. It's, yeah. That's just the story. That's the story, and people are going to stick to it. So, yeah, we had, uh, prior to the Michael Jackson thing, we had the um, uh, McMartin Bucky, um, which kind of started it off on the preschool stuff. And, you know, that got picked up and just amplified in the media. And it turns out that none of it was true, but these people went to trial and they got convicted. Um, yeah. 
And that's, you know, the, the problem that we find is that that's way too common in the society. And so, um, you know, as uh, uh, Karen talked about on this thing about the Toronto police, having been bullied by feminists into adopt, adopt, uh, adopting uh, listen and believe as their best practices, um, they failed completely. Yeah. And we find, you know, that's, as, as Karen pointed out, that's an engineered failure. But there's a lot of failures that happen simply by themselves where people do not follow the evidence. Um, and, the, and the state does, it's the state that does the prosecution. I mean, you get hauled out of your house and dragged down and, you know, you got to put up bail and find a lawyer and, and finance the whole thing. Otherwise, you're going to lose in court and you're just going to sit there forever. And then somehow you have to publicly clear your name and image after the steam stops because yeah. as soon as the evidence starts coming out that it wasn't Hey, guys, actual... i got to split. i got a call coming in. Okay, fair enough. Talk to you later, John. But as soon as you, you find out evidence that nothing happened, the news story dies. Yeah. So you never hear about it again, and you're left with the idea that you were initially presented with, regardless of the validity yeah. of the statement. You know, it's, it's not just this kind of thing. I mean, these sorts of lies, these yeah. memes that, that establish lies, happen all the time. And the question is, who's around to debunk them? because they'll splash across the front page. I mean, yeah. one of the ones, let's take something that's really ridiculous, air plastic. There was a company that was trying to raise money and they invented this scam called air plastic, said that they had a process to take carbon out of the air and make plastic. Sure. Okay. Yeah, to basically it would be a simultaneous effort to clean up the atmosphere of the carbon monoxide and create a product with it. Yeah, you know that they're gonna, they're gonna yeah. solve global warming yeah. by doing this. By recycling air, essentially. And, you know, the amount of air that you would have to process to get enough carbon to make one pound of plastic is just enormous. Yes, yeah, it's astronomical. And uh, assuming you could do it. Mm -hmm. um, assuming you have a wizardy extraction method that no one else has ever thought of, yeah. some alchemical process that occurs. <laughs> and, it, and it's completely, you know, I mean, the thermodynamics is completely yeah. wrong. In other words, when you look at a case like that, it is so extreme that, you know, any, anyone who understands any level of science is going to say no. But that, that meme, along with many, many more, Solar exactly roadways. like this. Um, it just plays out there. Yeah, solar roadways. And they never, it stuff. never goes away. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, once it hits, it's there forever, no matter how absurd. Well, again, once it's disproven, nobody cares. Yeah. So the news of a new discovery spreads a lot faster than the news that that discovery was a lie. Yeah. Because you're really excited about the first, so you tell everyone you know for a while, and you guys are all talking about it, and then when it finds out it's not dead, people are still excited about it, and it never mm -hmm. really quite gets around with the same fervor. Yeah, it's always. You know, as Karen said at the beginning of the video, you know, it only it takes five minutes to spew all of this stuff with a fire hose and hours to clean it up afterwards. Yeah. And she's absolutely right about that because, you know, all of these little bumper sticker things. I mean, I, I went through this thing. I, I may as well talk about it. It's the same basic principle. I, you know, was involved with the Occupy group and we we're talking about trying to put together a place where homeless people could go. And so I was suggesting a model that um, used, you know, we, greenhouses. There's a whole interest, industry that makes greenhouses pretty inexpensively. And that we could, you know, build these medium-sized greenhouses and put, you know, 20, 30, 40 people inside each one. And, you know, maybe have 10 of them on a piece of land that, that we were looking at. And um, could do that for a small amount of money and service a couple hundred people. And this woman who was involved in it wanted tiny houses. Now, tiny houses are really good. And her big thing was she wanted a door that you could lock. Yeah. Okay? So for the same amount of money on the same piece of land, uh, you can put tiny houses to put maybe 30 people, or you could put greenhouses to service, you know, 200 to 300. Yeah. So what she did uh, to shut me up was she started a campaign um, where she was emailing and tweeting and doing stuff like that, saying that I was a violent, quote, I was a violent offender and she was afraid of me. And, you know, in fact, I had city councilors in Eugene forward me emails that Gene Stacy had sent to them. But the bottom line was it made it so, it made it impossible for me to function within those groups. Yeah. Okay, so she, 
you know, took over by manufacturing a lie and basically trying me in the public uh, or the court of public opinion. If I'd had the money, I'd have taken her to court for slander and libel. I don't, but of course I wouldn't have gotten anything. She doesn't have any money. Yeah. You know, very shallow pockets, but the bottom line is she did three months of character assassination. Pretty is, good. Is that something that should happen? And the problem that I see with this is it's become the norm. Yeah. Just like these women going after this, this rape case on this guy. His, he was a radio personality in Canada. His, yeah. his life is ruined. Okay, he was, you know, very popular, making a big income. It's done. Oh, yeah. He'll never work in that industry again. Yeah. And, and he did nothing wrong. No. What he, what he did was he failed to service a woman the way she wanted to be serviced for the rest of her life. And she taught him a lesson. Yeah. Well, and the, the thing is, is it's, he's a radio personality. Yeah. So is it possible he's a complete piece of crap? As she said, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of what you got involved with. Yeah. This was the hand you were shaking. This, isn't, this wasn't forced upon you. He's not yeah. a forced marriage. Yeah. You pursued him. Well, I mean, just, just take, take lots of examples. Um, I dated a woman um, for about five years, uh, actually a professor at the University of, of uh, California at Irvine. And eventually we broke up. Um, and she wound up getting married. So what did she do? She selected an alpha male, and then years later, she's complaining that she can't win an argument with him. Yeah. Okay? You get what you select. Yeah. It's just most people are not aware of the realities that they're buying into in a relationship. Well, and they want all the passion is yeah. the other thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people realize that making a decision like that, it, it sounds cold and, cal and, yeah. and calculating, but you have to be somewhat cold and calculating to make a long-term investment like that. Yeah. But, but, let's look at, but let's look at passion. For many people, it's simply, I need a, I need a burst of adrenaline yeah. in order to feel passion. And what does adrenaline mean? It means you're afraid. Mm -hmm. So you pick, you pick people who are scary, and you get in relationships with them. And lo and behold, you say, well, they scare me. Yeah. And that goes both you know, in, the, in the male picking you know, selection error you know, case and the female selection error case. But I think I'll take the last 40 seconds to basically thank Karen for this video. I did get a hold of her and asked for permission to use it. And we bleeped out all the F-bombs. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's just a, a really excellent assessment of the insanity that is going on in this society where we have essentially a lich mob, I'm call them feminists, um, who've been doing this kind of thing. And it just... It's fabulous to have you know, people like Karen out there, and she's been at it for five or six years now, pretty seriously. And I want to thank you for watching, and we'll talk about this more next week.